Welcome to the monthly conversation with Konstantin Samailov, who is one of the most respected Russian voices on YouTube about what is happening inside Russia. Konstantin is a well-known YouTuber whose channel Inside Russia comments insightfully on his country's descent into authoritarianism over the last few years. And I think this is probably one of the most poignant moments where we will have spoken following the funeral of Alexei Navalny. Now, Konstantin is outside of Russia with no idea when he can return there. Please do like and subscribe if you like the video and our fantastic speakers. Please do also check out the verified Ukrainian charities in the description of the video. They do incredible work with veterans uh, and uh, many other good causes there as well. Konstantin, welcome back to the channel. Stick to be here. I was looking for forward to our conversation. Always a pleasure. Thank you. And yet again, I mean, we're... We are struggling to actually choose topics. I mean, when we first started this series, I thought, oh, are we going to have enough to talk about? We actually have to be very selective of the topics we talk about because so much has happened in the last four weeks. Well, today we're going to talk about the Russian economy. We're going to talk about the second anniversary of the war, about Tucker Carlson and Navalny. But let's start with the second anniversary of the war because, you know, this this is one of the biggest stories, uh, and of course, it is a tremendous tra uh, tragedy that we are now into the third year of this incredible uh, and terrible bloodletting. We are uh, in the third year, and I still can't believe it. At times, it seems absolutely unreal. Um, tragedy changed Russia so much. It changed Ukraine so much. Changed our lives, my life so much. Absolutely a tragedy. It still goes on, but there are some important features of difference, I think, that uh, are worth pointing out. Of course, the media focuses in on stalemate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We know these narratives are still going on. They focus very much on what's happening in the uh, U.S. Congress and the stalled aid and so on. But what they don't talk about are some of the extraordinary Ukrainian victories. And I, the angle I want to sort of throw at you is what effect this must be happening having on uh, you know Russian decision makers, Russian uh, army commanders, and so on. So the first thing, of course, is that last winter electricity supplies were very intermittent throughout Ukraine. Uh, the strikes against energy infrastructure were relatively successful last year, and they really made life tough for a lot of people. This year, there's been barely any outages. Uh, Ukraine has regained control of the skies to an extent. It doesn't stop all the missiles, of course, and we see appalling tragedies taking place, but by and large, the infrastructure is holding up. That resilience doesn't really get coverage in the media, but is kind of remarkable. And then the last couple of weeks, um, we have seen the extraordinary story, I think, of 14 uh, uh, Russian uh, fighter jets, uh, and of course, one AWACS A-50 uh, shot out of the sky in almost as many days. Um, so there's extraordinary success happening. Um, this this must be quite disturbing, I would have thought, for you know Russian commanders. Um, I'm not sure what Russian commanders are thinking. Um, you know, I'm not a big expert on military um, things, but <clears throat> I am pretty darn sure they are concerned. And perhaps the afraid, okay, because what has happened in the last year or so, um, war switched from Ukraine to Russia. And if you remember, it happened in 2023, and it happened in, um, I believe in May, late April or May, when um, Belgorod started getting bombed, and then the, the bombing spread out through Russia, Moscow, and then um, other cities in the latest St. Petersburg. Today, the governor of St. Petersburg, Leningrad province, flew around St. Petersburg with an icon, you know, asking God to protect St. Petersburg from drones and, and attacks. Okay, this is 
this is definitely a change that we saw in the last year okay in the year number two so the war switched from ukrainian soil well it's still happening there but now it's also in russia and this must have a psychological effect but i wonder whether all of the news gets through i mean you and i will watch uh, uh you know diaspora media like michael narki and others and we have a, a, a good grasp of what's going on and so there is all this information in russian for people who know where to find it and who are keen to find it but i wonder whether this is getting through to uh, the majority of the population or whether people are actually interested in finding this information out. Is this something that we just you know, can't know? Or do we have perhaps, or is it possible to get a reasonable idea of how well-informed uh, the Russian population is? Or is it going to vary very widely between you know, people in rural areas, cities, educated, et cetera? Jonathan, answering your question in a simple way, no, it does not get through. It used to get through in the beginning when every attack was a cosmic scale event, so to speak. Oh, how could they? Oh, you know, what happened? Oh, this and that. So they did um, talk about it in the media. Uh, propaganda showed it under different angles, okay? But then attacks became, um, there are so many of them, and then they became so... They, they happen so often that uh, Russian propaganda, all the media, they are acting as if nothing happens. If it's a huge bombing, for example, there were huge bombings of um, oil refineries near St. Petersburg, then it gets mentioned something like, it was an explosion, but everything is fine. Um, a bombing or, uh, uh, you know, blowing up at Navalipetsky Medkombinat, eh, it was a small fire. It was put out quickly. Things like that. So if you are a Russian and if you don't really seek for information, like, for example, I do, you will not see a full picture of what's happening in Russia. And then many people, they don't even want to see the picture too. You know, this is a phenomenon that I don't really understand. Many Russians are living in their bubbles, informational bubbles, and they don't want to look outside, what's outside their bubble. Uh, because it hurts. When they look outside and they start quest asking questions, and their reality does not really match the real reality, you know, what's happening, then uh, it, it hurts. It, it hurts. It, it's... Uh, cognitive dissonance it's you know they start asking questions once you start asking questions oh that's when you step on a shaky ground because you know what once you realize that your country is not doing something real good or doing is something not not good you know then it starts if you're at least half human being something of hum human being left inside of you you know starts hurting right here just about here where your heart is Okay, and then a lot of people, they kind of understand, but they try to eliminate that reality outside their bubble. But you know what? You can't keep living inside the bubble sooner or later. And very, I, I think it's much sooner than later. Um, the bubbles will be bursting. I think we're standing on a verge of a situation when stinky substance will start hitting the fan very, very soon. And you know we're gonna we're gonna tackle a number of different topics, but this also I think can be related to Navalny. I think once you know when uh, Alexei Navalny was in prison, it was possible to more or less, you know, he's okay, he's alive, right? Everything's okay. There's still hope. Let's just forget about it. Maybe Putin, you know, okay, Putin's a bad guy, but there are bad guys everywhere. And this actually is what Tucker Carlson said. We're going to come to that in a minute. But that that line is often used by propagandists. <laughs> but it does allow ordinary people to think, well, okay, let's, you know, he's in prison. I can't do much about that. But, you know, things aren't that bad. And then he dies. Then he is, as everyone suspects, uh, murdered. And then 
it's almost inescapable, the idea that the people in charge are not just bad, they are the worst. They're the absolute worst. They are uh, homicidal maniacs. They're, they're killers and psychopaths. Uh, suddenly, I think that thought must be inescapable to many, many more people who were able to pretend that wasn't the case just a few days ago. I agree. That's You described it fairly well. I would say the Rubicon has been passed um, and the masks are off. Uh, and this is not the first time the situation is happening in Russia. There's a direct um, relation, di direct comparison to 1930. Basically, what we are in 2024 as if we were in 1932, before the Red Terror started. Okay. Um, there's always a trigger something that um, makes things go forward. A decision is made, and then things will start going forward fast, okay? And then I think Navalny's death is one of such triggers, okay? So yes. that's what I think. We are in 1932 right now, and 1933 is just a step away. I think we're already there, we just don't know it. Absolutely agree with you. I've been saying this a couple of times on the channel in the last uh, couple of weeks, and it's a rubicon as well, isn't it, for the who those who people who are in the Russian opposition. There are those who will continue the so-called vegetarian tactics, those who consider uh, working through legal means, because Navalny ultimately was something of romantic. He was also a believer in in being able to work through peaceful means to achieve your ends. There will be some people now who do not think that is any more a viable option. Um, there are people like Panamariev who for a while have been saying that's not going to work. Now, I'm not advocating for one or the other, but it's another form of Rubicon. It's another uh, junction at which people are faced with choices. And one of those choices, of course, is to do nothing and to... Uh, Put your head in the sand but for others it's a difficult uh sort of bifurcation of of choice there are many people in russia who are doing nothing and will continue doing nothing um but what navalny deaths death sh showed me showed to many of us is that not everyone in russia is sitting out and you know doing nothing um if you look at how many people showed up at his funeral then you have looked <laughs> that's amazing um every single person who showed up was photographed and filmed they were thousands and thousands of uh, sardu cars all around ready to move ready to pack people ready to you know throw them into the the buses and so forth. And yet, tens of thousands of people came. They keep on coming. They keep, this This is going on the fourth day right now and people are still keep on coming. Uh, Navalny's um, grave right now is a huge pile of flowers and the Sardo cars remove the flowers every so often. But the flowers, um, are still like a huge amount okay so it just shows you that not all russians are sitting and doing nothing what's going to happen in the future i don't know but um there's definitely people who are ready to act who have had enough and who understand that the rubicon have been passed and there are people who say well okay you know um, they're simply visiting the grave. I mean, they're not out there protesting. This isn't my darn. But I think they underestimate um, the power of the Russian state, as you say, because not only are they photographing people, um, in the last couple of years, uh, the authorities of Moscow using, it has to be said, Western components and technology, including, I believe, some British components, have built an extraordinary technological system of facial recognition extremely powerful system and of course 
everybody in the population is going to be registered, photo ID'd to get social security and various other things. So as you say, everybody at that, pro uh, not a protest, everybody in the queue, everyone visiting Navalny's grave uh, or placing flowers in places like the Solovetsky Stone, um, they risk uh, a visit sooner or later by the security services. And it's not that they're, you know, they're doing this and they're not aware of it. I think every single person, as you say, who turned up will know that they are photographed and under threat of arrest. And if you and I can sense the coming terror, um, then they will all be, I think, acutely aware of the risk that they're taking. Boy, Jonathan, uh... Um, they are aware, trust me, this feeling of fear when someone follows you is big. I, we went here in Uzbekistan, we went to the memorial of the victim of political oppressions to lay flowers, just to lay flowers to honor Navalny. And we were followed by, um, what I believe were Russian operatives. Each one of us were followed here in Tashkent. And you know what? It's not a good feeling when you're followed. It's scary. Uh, I don't... I just wish that no one goes through that feeling. So in Moscow, it must have been even much worse. Okay? So not only that they know that they might be um, targets of Russian government terror, they probably will be. They, they, they Not probably, they will be. Okay, in one way or another, they know that. And yet, still, they still came. They still showed up, they still stood st stood tall, and they still spoke out. And what they spoke out was extraordinary. I think it has surprised uh, many Ukrainians in, 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 in a way. Uh, you know, they have uh, praised that. And... Uh, some of the slogans were extraordinary, and I, I think they took both you and I by surprise as well. Putin is a killer uh, was one. Also, Ukrainians are good people and other, you know, very sharp, very critical slogans. Um, that is also extraordinarily brave in the circumstances, I think. But well, something that uh, nothing like we had not heard before, you know, like years before and so forth but under circumstances this is this is i would say heroic and let's not dwell too much on the terror but there are certain things as you say that are triggers that are going to make putin and his uh gang uh more and more paranoid i think in the coming weeks and months one of these of course is the declining economic situation now i've been following some of the sort of superficial stories i've been following some some great journalism again from vladimir emilov michael nakinson and they're talking about the extraordinary impact of inflation but i think that's just the tip of the iceberg isn't it there are all sorts of things going wrong one of the interesting examples was i think um uh, so-called agorzi which is sort of pickled cucumbers which uh, are a bit of a staple sort of food uh, many people sort of will eat those with a whole variety of meals uh, weekly uh, but those have uh, become extraordinarily expensive one of the reasons given is that the in the manufacturing process in the horticulture process um, a lot of foreign components are required in the growing process and those are becoming rarer and rarer as you know, the agriculture industry starts to break down without the parts that it needs. I think, however, you're going to tell us that things are potentially far worse than just not having cucumbers. Jonathan, a little off topic, if I may. Uh, more and more, I feel lately that I'm living a deja vu. <laughs> I remember the situation with potatoes when I was a child. Um, I was like 10 or 12 years old. It was 1986, 87, something like that. And, you know, in Russia, in the USSR, we did not have fruits and vegetables uh, in the wintertime. Only in the summertime when they actually grew, okay? Because that, that's how it worked. But 
uh, when Gorbachev came and he allowed for small businesses to be open and uh, to create products and sell them, I remember small farms started opening up and they were uh, they were growing uh, cucumbers in greenhouses. And I remember I was with my father. We came to a store, Cooperative, it used to be called, and they were selling cucumbers in the midst of winter, like in February, you know, uh, and the cucumbers cost 10 rubles per kilo. So you understand, my father had a very good job. He was in charge of many um, engines, uh, railroad engines, and he was making like 120, 150 rubles per month, enough to buy 10 to 13 kilos of cucumbers at that price. And then he was standing. He couldn't believe that they cost so much. He was standing there and he looking at them. They came back home and he told my mom, he said, well, we have cucumbers in the winter now. <laughs> you know what? 10 rubles per kilo. So this is a deja vu what we're living. Now, a lot of, a lot of people I heard um, say, well, how come there aren't any shortages in Russia? There's so much food on shelves. Yeah, there's food, but the cucumbers cost pretty penny now. And it'll get to the point, I'm pretty convinced, it'll get to the point where people will be standing in front of cucumbers, just like me and my father back in 1987, looking at them and saying, well, we have cucumbers, <laughs> we can't afford them, okay? So um, that's that was off topic, sorry. Um no, it's, right. it's it's a very important topic. I mean, I I came to uh, uh, Moscow for the very first time in 1992, and that's just a few years after you're talking about there. But still, there were things in the shops. There were people selling things on the street. But as you say, actually, people most people didn't have much money at that time. So that summer of 1992, when I arrived in Moscow. The city was empty. No, no. It was completely. Yeah. I mean, in it was empty too. Yeah. There were things, but much they better were. than nineteen yeah. eighty-six. Yeah, <laughs> much but better. Nonetheless, people were still very anxious uh, about the amount of money they had. They were very anxious about being able to afford food. So that summer, the city was empty, and almost everybody who could get away from their jobs would go to their dacha to grow their own food because people just, you know, had that uh, sense of sort of, yeah, I'm not quite even paranoia. I mean, it, it's just they, they genuinely, uh, a lot of people didn't have the money to go to those shops and cooperatives. And of course, if you can top up by having your own supplies of food, you uh, you can mix in a little bit of the commercial stuff and your own stuff. Um, I, I wonder whether people are going to be doing that as things become more dire and prices go up, people are going to go and say, okay, let's just go and uh, start growing our own stuff, at least depend on ourselves if the state is starting to uh, fail us. You bet. You bet they will. Because um, it almost seems like if we're going back in like 1986, 1987, things are... They won't be able, it's not like there will be shortages of, for example, potatoes. Back in the USSR, there was shortages of potatoes. So uh, I myself uh, was helping my parents and we grew potatoes in the summertime. Hated that. <laughs> Absolutely. Still hate touching potatoes, you know, pick them up uh, out of the ground still to this day. But anyway, so people will go back, we call it uh, to the ground to uh, grow their own food, to can it, so they can survive. It's just economic tsunami that is coming to Russia is so, it's really hard to understand. We'll see it soon. It's, it's, it's here, okay? Um, Russia has fundamentally two big problems. One problem is earning too little, and another, the second problem is it's, it's spending too much. It's spending too much by financing the war, unnecessary war, the tragic war. And then it's earning too little because it lost most of the revenue streams 
you know, we can compare economy to household. You know, household has income. Um, you know, two parents work and they spend for mortgage, for bank loans, for car loans, for children. All of a sudden, imagine your um, spendings have gone through the roof and you make like three or four times less than you used to. And this is how Russian economy is doing. Right now, they're trying to sugarcoat everything to show that economy is doing fantastic. Vladimir Putin came out a few days ago and addressed the National Assembly saying how he's going to be making Russia that is already not bad, he's going to be making it gr so much greater. And it's going to be a fantastic place by 2030, okay? Um, in reality, he doesn't have any money to do that. OK, um, right now, there are so many problems in the Russian economy and no one really knows how to solve them. If you looked at the faces of, well, for example, Elvira Nabiulina during the address to the Federal Assembly <laughs> wasn't a happy face because she knows she knows what's really going on. She knows what's going to happen right after the election presidential election in the late March, in uh, early, mid-April, perhaps, you know. So Russian economy is not well. Inflation is just one part of the economy that uh, Russians going to feel it with their own pockets. They're going to feel so much. Oh, I that could be talking hours about the economy, you know. And it's, it's, it's in some ways, it, 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 of course, it's terrible. But in some ways, this could be, uh, if we're being optimistic, a way to uh, end the war. Um, I don't believe it's going to be won on the battlefield by either side at this point in time, unless there is some kind of substantial change in munitions or innovation. It's just going to carry on being horrifically um, attritional on the ground. But if the Russian economy, if, if the collapse starts accelerating, that could be an extraordinary good thing. Could be a good thing for Russians as well, because ultimately, if the war ends sooner, fewer are going to be mobilized, fewer are going to die. Um, but do you think mobilization is likely after the war, uh, after the election, rather, or coronation, as I'm referring Personal. it to? <laughs> That's, uh, you are not way off target, you know, it is a coronation. And I absolutely agree with you that when I say it's terrible for Russia, it's terrible in a sense that uh, Russian people are going to go through hardship, but it will bring the war to end sooner. Okay, I agree. That's excellent. And another thing, I also agree that Russia has a chance of being reborn as Phoenix. Okay, but before it's reborn, it needs to burn to the ground, just like Phoenix did. Okay. And burning to the ground is um, this system that Putin has created, that um, basically a totalitarian system, the vertical of power, it's got to go. With this system, or at least parts of the system in place, Russia has no chance. In order to have a chance, in order to come back to the family of normal countries with normal economy, normal politics, and so forth, you know, normal behavior... It needs to get rid of uh, the vertical of power. That's that's the tricky bit, isn't it? Uh, that is the difficult bit. I know there are uh, competing ideas on on how to do that. Um, Ardohovsky, Mikhail Ardohovsky has laid some out. Um, Ilya Panamaryev has some other ideas there. Um, Interestingly, I think Navalny's team has never been super detailed about how they would reconstruct the vertical of power. They've talked about sort of, you know, reducing it, tinkering with it. They've talked about sort of weeding out corruption and so on. But there's never been a really, I don't think anyway, a detailed program of how to reform uh, the system. I mean, we, we don't have time to get into all of that. It's, we could probably spend a couple of days talking about that. Um, but certainly defeat in the war, I think, is an important first step in the destruction of the vertical of power, isn't it? Um, 
absolutely absolutely well things gonna get worse before they get better and yes you're right Navalny and his team were criticized quite a lot for not having they were very strong at you know uh fighting the system bringing corruption out but uh they were weak for having a long-term plan on how to fix things so just I, I remember that quite well um so it's gotta get worse before it gets better and um the war must stop it will stop sooner or later and um well depends on depending how it stops depending on the reasons you see there are two many scenarios right now uh most of them most likely well i think most likely the war will come from the <laughs> stop of the war the end of the war will come from inside russia okay that that was i am certain but there are different scenarios of uh depending what kind of scenario prevails you know um uh, there's a scenario of revolution of civil war there's a scenario of a power group um gaining power in russia and uh, turning russia russia's course to a different direction there are so many things but yeah the vertical that the war must stop must end that's of course step number one and while we talk about the the sort of collapse and where you've got putin who seems to be in a fairly triumphant mood, which is sort of odd given what's going on, that given this extraordinary kind of Potemkin facade that is created, that everything's normal, everything is great, everything is going to be even better. Um, and then behind it, just literally behind it, it's rotting, it stinks, it's falling apart. Um, then you have somebody like the sort of sinister, clownish figure of Tucker Carlson coming in and helping to prop up that kind of propagandistic facade um what was your feeling because i know you've watched it what was your feeling when you saw the not just the interview but also the propagandistic videos he made in the moscow metro for instance and so on i mean that that made that made more of an impression on me than the than the interview itself which was rather rather dull let me tell you, I have mixed feelings about him coming to Moscow. Uh, as soon as I saw the reports of him sitting in the Bolshoi theater in one of the boxes, um, I made a live stream where I was predicting that there would be an interview soon. And I was predicting, I predicted what Putin would say uh, in the interview. And it kind of came true. So when I was watching in the interview itself, uh, you're right. It was dull. Uh, dull is not even. I think it's not the correct word. It was a little bit crazyish. Um, I was impressed with Carlson though during the interview because he made Putin feel uncomfortable, and uh, Putin it felt sincere. Okay, he pressed Putin. Uh, Putin uh, lost his temper. A few times i did not see that for a long time before okay H hadn't seen that happening for happened in, in a long time and then what i definitely would shake carlson carlson's uh hand for was at the very end he was trying to get gershkovich home and he didn't just ask putin he was persistent he was pressing putin okay mm -hmm. Putin actually had a great opportunity to uh, improve his image by releasing Gershkovich right then. Okay, but he blew it. He didn't understand. But anyway, I, I really like that about Tucker Carlson. Okay, and uh, after he was done, he released the interview. And of course, he started releasing this crazy videos about him enjoying Moscow subway, uh, you know, about food at the Russian supermarkets and so forth, how beautiful Moscow is. Well, I certainly did not understand that. Um, I certainly did not understand that. I heard Berlin was beautiful back in mid thirties, was clean, nice roads. And, uh, you know, everything was nice there. Does it mean that Berlin was a good place for Jews? Um, no, kind of same comparison can be made with moscow these days you know 
Moscow has always been clean. Moscow's subway has always been nice. Um, you know, but <laughs> Tucker Carlson didn't really talk about what's going with what's going on with mobilization. Okay. Uh, what people, uh, policemen and servicemen catch just uh, regular young folks and, you know, get them to mobilization centers from the metro. You know, he was uh, of high opinion and he was showing it how wonderful Russian stores are. But, and he talked about it, but, um, well, does he know how many people can go and afford food at the Russian stores compared to how many were before? Uh, I think this is the important stuff you need to talk about. So I have mixed feelings. I liked some things about the interview and I disliked what, what he did after. But, you know, he was uh, interviewed by a fellow named Lex Friedman, I believe, a couple of days ago. And he was very, very um, critical of Putin and of Putin had to say. And uh, it almost felt like um, Tucker Carlson woke up and saying, what? He was started telling the truth about his interview. So <laughs> that added um, to the, you know, having mixed feelings, at least uh, at me. And yeah, I wonder whether that interview with Lex Friedman was, I think he came to realize that um, he didn't score a big win. You know, he, he went and he risked quite a lot by going to Moscow, risked his reputation amongst a, a broad section of the American public. But he didn't get the huge kind of win he wanted. He didn't get the, you know, he didn't get the, uh, I think, the respect he 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 wanted from Putin. Putin was quite dismissive of him. And, you know, as Putin always does, he tries to make people feel quite small who are in his presence. It's a classic piece of power theatre, which he has already adopted. And I think, yeah, that wasn't what Tucker Carlson was was expecting. But there's an extraordinary echo of the 1930s as well, isn't there? Because you had Western journalists going to Moscow during the height of the Great Terror, and some of them saw what was going on, uh, and a few of them wrote about it, but many didn't. You know, they would be visited, uh, they'd visit the Bolshoi, they'd stay at the Metropole, we all know, what the sort of uh, Czech or KGB agents would get up to there and the lovely girls that would pay them uh, attention, etc. cetera. Um, it has a sort of strange echo of that 1930s uh, sort of uh, uh, blindness that some journalists sort of, sort of choose to veil themselves with. Well, you know, one thing I got to give the credit to um, Tucker Carlson I had a feeling he was sincere. Okay, I did not have a feeling like he was paid uh, by Russian government and so forth. That, you know, whatever he did, he he did it in sincerity. That's what I think. Um, he was the only one who came to Moscow. He was the only one who made Putin uncomfortable. Well, uh, but he, the, he the not... only one who's not going to be arrested, probably. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. Yes. He's, he's, you know, he didn't score much in the United States or in the West, but he certainly did score in Russia big. <laughs> yeah. You know? I mean, I they would... have uh, made him a hero of Russia. <laughs> I'd, I'd be happy to interview Putin and make him very uncomfortable, but of course, that's never that's never going to happen. Yeah, And I wouldn't get out of the country, I think, uh, in one piece either. But you know, it's, it's easy for us to sit here in the comfort and safety of our homes and talk about it, but... It's another thing if you're sitting right, really right in front of a Putin, surrounded by, you know, the KGB agents, you know, <laughs> that's intimidating and scary, you know. So, uh, but also we have to take that into consideration. It is. <laughs> whoever, I might yeah. not even get out of here alive. Whoever you are, yeah. And the, the Kremlin is a very forbidding place as well. I mean, it's uh, the weight of history, the, the sinister history that hangs over the place. It's... Uh, it's quite something. It's like stepping into the uh, the mouth of the dragon, isn't it? It's uh... yes. so we should probably end up uh, back where we started. The second uh, anniversary of the war. It's seen some extraordinary. It's seen some terrible things. It also, I mean, I think you and I have have, have been very aware of the significance of events as they've been unfolding. 
we've predicted some of them or at least more or less got got some of that right i certainly thought the full scale war was going to happen but it does seem that over the last 2 years many western governments have been so so slow to react so slow to rearm so slow to see the threat that uh putin's regime uh really represents to the world well the democratic world at least I don't know. I get the sense, though, in the last couple of weeks that Europe has finally waking up to the threat and the first moves to rearm, to defend uh, European values um, are really starting to take shape. Democracies tend to move incredibly slowly, unfortunately. But when they do start moving, when they get themselves onto a war footing, then they have a lot of resources to call upon um do you think that if this is true and the west is going to go on to a war economy footing which was really just announced i think uh sort of yesterday um russia which is already on a war footing its economy has very much been retooled it will not be able to compete if the west really starts to take the threat seriously i don't know what you you feel though I feel that it will not be able to compete successfully. Um, it is not <laughs> competing successfully now. Um, you know, things are happening like the Chinese banks are refusing transactions with Russian companies. The Turkish banks are doing the same, closing the accounts of Russians, individuals and companies. And it's so many things. Russia is already at the state where it's at the very, very, very tough economic position. And if Europe steps up this competition, Russia will economically will fall apart. Absolutely. And I think that uh, Navalny's death was sort of a like last straw that is breaking Europe's back. Okay. Uh, it, it showed the true face of what uh, the rulers, current rulers of Russia are. And I think that will get to start Europeans faster. And we have to remember as well, as we have in many episodes, that uh, Vladimir Karmurza, Ilya Yashin and others, um, uh, Alek Orlov, who was only uh, sort of uh, put in prison this week for discrediting the Russian army, it's worth remembering these brave, brave individuals, they are at extreme risk where they are. And we can only hope that they are released to carry on the incredible work and uh, that their voices will be heard again. Um, so, yeah, there are people resisting and uh, we have to hope that they uh, they make it through uh, the turmoil that will unfold in the next couple of months. We hope and pray. Well, Constantine, it's always heartening to speak to you, no matter how gloomy or terrible the things we discuss. Uh, somehow speaking to you does give me hope that uh, Ukrainian victory uh, and transformation in Russia is possible and is possible in the near term. We can only hope that that's the case. Thank you so much for sharing your insights uh, and experiences with the audience yet again. Jonathan, thank you so very much. Um, it's been a pleasure. I'm looking forward to our next conversation.